committee meeting with the Equity Advisory Council for Thursday, May 30th, 2024. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, committee and council members will state their names before speaking. Ms. Siebel, please call the role of the board members to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Good evening, Dr. Savoy. Good evening. Ms. Siebel. Ms. Harvey. Yes. Present. Thank you, Ms. Drummond. Present. Thank you, Ms. Frempong. Ms. Lichter. Present. Ms. Tulusky. Okay, thank you. Ms. Siebel, please call the role of the Equity Advisory Council members participating in today's meeting. Okay, uh, Ms. Madan Shanawi. Ms. Valencia Banks. Ms. Scott. Ms. Wilson. Ms. Tillman. Mr. Collins. Mr. Schiffer. Ms. Sunderman Zinger. Ms. Nielsen. Ms. Greer, Ms. English, Ms. Sibley, Ms. Feeney. Present. Thank you. Ms. Harden. Ms. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Ms. Denmeyer. Ms. Brewster. All right, that is everyone. Um, were we able to get in um, our co-chairs? Ms. Siebel, uh, apologies for the interruption. Um, sure. a, as a reminder to those folks that we uh, needed to dial it on the phone using the keypad on your phone, dialing the, the asterisk or star six will mute and unmute you. So um, if we could try that functionality, that would be helpful. So, Mr. Corns, Ms. Seabolt, um, I did receive a message uh, from one of our co-chairs stating that it said uh, she hit star six and was told um, she was not allowed to unmute herself. Uh, Mr. Handy, if they, if they could try again, um, the setting sometimes does take a minute to uh, propagate through the system. Yes, sir. I will. Uh, one of them. Now. One of them was able to unmute. Should I proceed? That would be me, Ms. Ramadan Shanawi. I'm trying it out the system and it's working for me, so I'm not sure if it's working yes. for anybody else. Okay, we hear you. Thank you. Yep. This is Makita Scott. I'm unmuted. Can everyone hear me? Yes, yes thank you. Great, thank you. All right, and um, were we able to get Ms. Valencia Banks? Is there anyone else that um, I that I called um, that was not able to answer? So, Miss Ebo. Yes. Um, so, Miss Valencia Banks is on. Um, it looks like she's in transit. Okay. So, uh, just wanted to share that. All right. So we thank probably you. won't hear from her directly. Okay. All right. Well, I've noted that she is here. Thank you. Um, if there's anybody else that um, that is on that I did not call or that was not able to respond, um, please, please let us know. Otherwise, we'll continue on. Hello, Jivin Harden. I don't know if I was able to mute myself on time. 
I got you, Javine. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. All right, I think we can uh, proceed. All righty. Thank the you. First, thank you. The first item on the agenda is Equity Advisory Council Priorities. And for that, I call on Ms. Abir Ramadan Shinawi and Ms. Juliana Valencia Banks and Ms. Makita Scott, co chairs of the Equity Advisory Council, and Mr. Douglas Handy. All right. Thank you, Dr. Savoy. Uh, so on the screen, you have our uh, three priorities as stated by the council. I'm a member of the council along with uh, other internal and external uh, stakeholders. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to two of our three co-chairs, um, and they will be uh, presenting the three priorities that you see on the screen. They'll go into a little more detail in discussing the priorities. So at this time, I will turn it over to the co-chairs. Next slide, please. Good evening, everyone. I will be covering the first two slides. My name is Abir Ramadan Shanawi, former Baltimore County teacher uh, and now educational consultant. For our first topic of curriculum, I mean, I've worked in the curriculum office as well, so I'm very familiar with the importance of the two topics that we have um, on the slide, culturally responsive books and advanced placements or AP course offerings and enrollment. Um, to talk about culturally responsive books, I think there needs to be um, a deeper dive and a discussion around books that are being read in schools, um, whether it is through a curriculum audit or whether it's through an audit on what books are being read. A lot of the books that are being read that are required do not reflect our students, especially since we do have a predominantly um, student of color population. Uh, no required books about African Americans. Uh, I'm sure there aren't many required books about other members of ma major communities that are reflected in Baltimore County Public Schools. And we know that the research reflects that when students see themselves within the curriculum, whether it's a book, whether it's a lesson plan, whether it's an entire unit, students are more engaged. But also we need to look at culturally responsive books that represent communities of color, not only for students of, who come from those communities, but also students who are uh, white students who can learn from other communities as well. So the benefits for culturally responsive books are not just for the students that reflect them, but also for our <laughs> students as well, because we always say what's good for one group of students is group, uh, good for all. So we're looking at exploring issues for books that are more culturally responsive that reflect our students and that also show communities that are not one dimensional as well. Um, from my own personal experience as well as a Muslim, Arab, female, American um, growing up in the United States, looking at the books that are being read that reflect my community, my people, they're very one dimensional as well. So that gives a false pretense of who my people are, what the community is. And sometimes this is the very first time students are exposed to another culture. So being very intentional with the culturally responsive books should be a priority, especially as our demographics change and to really teach to the holistic approach of our students. Which leads to the AP or the advanced placement. Um, I think this has been something that's always been on our mind, but there needs to really be interrogation of the number of students who are who identify as black, uh, black, African American, or even his, um, Hispanic enrollment in EP classes. Um, we need to see why there is a disproportionality of the enrollment of students of color for AP classes. Um, and also how students are being chosen for these classes. And along with the AP placement, it, are the AP placement courses also being culturally reflective of their students as well? Where we know historically it has been predominantly white students and white courses, but how are we able to increase the number of students of color, especially black and Latino um, students, which are the growing population in our county and African students or black or African American students and how AP courses also reflect their culture and their background. So an interrogation about the courses taught and also the enrollment of other students, um, especially students of color and how they are actually being 
placed in those courses and why they may not be placed? What are some of the barriers that can be discussed in order to have an increased enrollment of other students for these courses as well? Um, so that is for curriculum. I'm sorry, I can't see, so I'm assuming somebody's clicking. If we can go to the next slide, which would be recruitment retention, I believe Ms. Uh, Scott will be covering this slide. Hello, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, so I can cover recruitment and retention. I'm sorry, I'm doing um, the next slide, sorry. You have it, okay. Yeah, sorry, you're doing the implicit bias training. I'll, I'll take this in recruitment yep. retention, my apologies. Um, no worries. So in, in tandem with curriculum, I think the three pieces for recruitment and retention are very important and they are all connected and interconnected. Not only are we looking for culture responsive books and curriculum and really diversifying AP placement, I think we also need to really look into how we're going to diversify not only the workforce, but also long term subs, because we know that's become um, somewhat of a of a need with the Baltimore County with a lot of teacher absences, but also with the influx of substitutes, what are the what are the supports that we're giving long term substitutes, but also um, student access for that and the mastery of grade level standards and advanced courses for long term substitutes to have um, as well. If we want long term substitutes as teachers, uh, we want to make sure that if they're there for Quite a while we give them the proper support and so there are any gaps for the students who are in those classrooms but also for the teachers or the substitute teachers to feel supported and we also know that sometimes these um, those who go in as substitute teachers end up becoming full-time teachers so it'd be a good way to gain some retention of substitute teachers who eventually become full-time teachers and that would be a, a really good benefit for baltimore county public schools um, diversification of the workforce, this has been a topic that's come on for, for many people, especially teachers of, of color that we, we work for, I'm um, sorry, we work with. Um, and not only are we looking at curriculum where students can see themselves and the work that they're doing, it's very important. And again, the statistics show that when students are exposed to a, a black teacher, female or male, especially if they're male, they're um, engagement increases as well and it's very important for students to see other people in the classroom that reflect them and that are there to support them and understand them. So we're looking towards developing and implementing an objective and actionable strategies uh, recommendations for recruitment and retention for a diverse workforce. Are we asking teachers of color currently what they're experiencing? Are we looking to see who we want to bring in and why we are bringing in teachers of color? Is Baltimore County actively seeking uh, particular schools of education that have um, that could be HBCUs? All of those schools that have teachers of color that are graduating as new graduates, are we recruiting them? What are we also doing with the diversification of the workforce? What are we also doing to help retain those teachers so they aren't gone after their second or third year because they didn't get the proper support? We know that teachers of color face many, many obstacles not only just the professional part of teaching, but also all the other issues that come with it, with environment. Some teachers of color do experience a toxic work environment or administrators or other teachers who don't understand them or don't understand their needs, or they're also used for um, particular pieces of the classroom that they weren't really, aren't supposed to be necessarily just to do that. So for example, discipline. So how are we diversifying the workforce, but also helping support teachers of color and listening to their needs in order to, to create a better conducive work environment for them and their colleagues. Last one, support for immigrant teachers of Spanish. So immigrant teachers of Spanish courses are struggling to pass the praxis, which is developed for native English speakers, which I think is very, very important, but also when Ms. Scott talks about implicit bias training, there's a lot of that bias when we have any type of assessment or testing. If we have immigrant teachers of Spanish, but the test is written for people who speak English, it's kind of um, it defeats the purpose. We want 
teachers of Spanish to come in and teach Spanish because that's their native language, how are we giving them access to teach their native tongue to other students if we want our students to be proficient in a particular language? And if they're taking a test to pass that was for native speakers, not only are they learning, they have to learn how to code switch, but also testing takes a particular skill that is very different, say, in the United States than the country that they come from. So we need to look at a way that we can hire immigrant teachers of Spanish where they can definitely de um, develop their skill set in teaching, but also be able to be um, to pass these tests in order for them to become um, teachers in Baltimore County in order for them to really teach in their native tongue. So we need support for these immigrant teachers as well through language, through support and taking the practice or finding other ways that we can get them accredited to teach without having them to really struggle. It's enough to have to come to another country and learn another language. Although many teachers who speak more than one language are able to, but testing is always a different layer. We all know that. So if we want to recruit also immigrant teachers of Spanish, I think we have to create the proper support. And the concept of equity, whether it's diversification of the workforce, support for substitutes, support for teachers of Spanish, support for students, we need to work in terms of equity that fits the particular need of that particular group. We can't look at equity and these supports as a blanket statement that is one for all teachers. All teachers are not the same. All teachers don't experience things at the workforce as the same, and the way they teach and the way they approach students are not the same as well. So if we're talking about immigrant teachers of Spanish, they come in with their own cultural needs and their own cultural way of doing things, and we need to honor and appreciate that, and how can that be an asset? The same thing for diversification of the workforce. If we want to bring in and recruit teachers of color, especially black male teachers, which is a dire, dire need, how are we putting teachers in place with the proper support so they aren't boxed into one position. And we look at them in multidimensional factors and making sure that they have the proper support because that is a need that Baltimore County has, but also what are we doing that's very unique to their needs as well. So we need to look at these particular elements as a need for Baltimore County as one, but approaching their needs has to be unique to who these people are. Substitute teachers are not most of the time they're career changers or they are not teachers by training. So if we want them to come in, what are we doing to help train them? Same for diversification of the workforce and making sure that we are being culturally relevant to teachers of color, especially if they are black teachers or even Latino teachers and immigrant teachers of Spanish as well, knowing that they come in as an asset speaking uh, Spanish fluently. How can that be an asset for students if we want students to become fluent in another language? but also how can we support them based on their cultural and their own professional and educational needs. So those are the two slides that I shared. I will hand it off to Ms. Scott. Thank you so much for that, Adir. And um, I'm sure we'll be able to follow up with any questions um, that come after the presentation. And again, I apologize. I am um, on the phone as well. Well, as I'm talking to my computer, so I hope everyone can hear me okay. And um, I will go to the implicit bias training slide. So I can't tell if that's up, but I hope it is. So the third um, priority that we came up with, and a little bit just to let you all know, this came from the advisory council. We are representing the council, but this is what we had a larger list of, and these were the three priorities that ended up um, as areas of focus for us. So the third is implicit bias training. And it says require mandate training for teachers, administrators, and everyone who works in the schoolhouse. And with that, it says we feel that everyone should be trained and aware of their implicit bias, uh, no matter what position they have in the schoolhouse. So that when anyone who interacts with children, works with children, teaches children, interacts with parents, um, has gone through implicit bias training, which is different than equity training. So that was one of the um, areas that we wanted to focus on. And also with that, 
include content on bias as it pertains to individual characteristics. And we wanted to list those because we wanted to be clear with what those characteristics are, such as but not limited to ability, cognitive, social, emotional, and physical. So examining our own biases as it relates to individual characteristics of students, of parents, um, of each other, of teachers, anyone that we come into contact with. Um, but that also is not limited to ethnicity, um, ethnicity as far as race, familial structure, the traditional family as opposed to chosen family, but examining our biases and being aware of that, gender identity and expression, language, national origin, which is some of what Abir um, spoke about as far as in our recruitment and retention of Spanish teachers, language, people who are not native English speakers, but also we have a diverse, um, we have a diverse group of students, uh, teachers, uh, parents, so making sure that we are looking at all of our national origins and ways that we may have biases. Nationality, race, religion, sex, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic status. So those are, um, are uh, some of the things that we wanted to focus on for our implicit bias training that we feel will make our environment, our schoolhouse, uh, more holistic. So um, that's all that I have for my slide. Um, thank you for giving us the time to, um, to present this. So thank you, um, Ms. Ramadan Shanawi. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, so at this point, committee members, you've heard from uh, two of our council co-chairs. Um, as Ms. Scott stated, what they were sharing was uh, three priorities were three priorities that were uh, actually developed by the members of the council. A longer list was actually whittled down into what you heard in these three top priorities. There are work groups that the council has formed, so a work group for each of the priorities. During the summer, the work will begin with the council starting to uh, put a lot more detail into these priorities and goals and uh, details needed to actually take the steps forward to address what you heard this evening. Uh, the council is also asking that the board equity committee uh, partner with the council in addressing uh, the needs and priorities that were shared. So. Uh, not necessarily looking for a formal vote, but certainly wanted to get some input from the committee on what you heard this evening. Um, wanted to know, are, you know, are these priorities that you feel like you can stand behind, that you could help support? Do uh, you have questions? Do you have concerns? Um, so at this point, um, I will turn over to Dr. Savoy um, and the committee members to respond to the presentation that they've heard. Dr. Savoy. I am so sorry. I was doing all that talking and nobody could hear me. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, I was saying that I'm particularly interested in diversity in the curriculum. I would like to get a copy of the uh, high school English curriculum as soon as possible. And also, um, I'm very interested. Everybody knows this is one of my real uh, pet peeves about the re re, uh, recruiting and the hiring and retention of uh, African Americans in the workforce, as far as in the teach in teaching, and also just di diversifying the workforce in general. Okay, and now anyone else have a statement? Would like to say something at this time? But I think it was a great presentation, and I really appreciate you uh, coming on, Advisory Council. Thank you so much. Um, anyone else? This is Mrs. Harvey. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Excuse me, Doc. Excuse me, Ms. Harvey. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, what I I I am in agreement that these. Uh, three areas, these three broad areas encompass um, a huge body of work around inclusion and equity and uh, diversity. I am also 
uh, hoping that as we move forward that we can uh, some of the things that we can do is uh, are, are to narrow some of our focus. I was I was very interested uh, in the part of the presentation around the cur curriculum in terms of the books that we use and are there already recommendations for how we can be more inclusive uh, at grade level for our students. Um, I agree that the, the work around testing and even if we're providing testing uh, for our multi-lingual uh, learners, that there is some contextual, uh, there are some contextual gaps in our translations and how we improve that. So that those nuances I think are important. Uh, I also am in, I'm a believer in training and I'm interested to see, but training builds capacity and it's how we have expectations around how we use our new capacity and how we support the use of that new understanding and learning with, throughout the system and throughout our staff that will really uh, implement a change. And so I'm really interested to hear your ideas around what that looks like beyond um, uh, implicit bias training and equity training. So I appreciate uh, the work that the council has done and I look forward to, to the deep dive into each area. Thank you for that. This is Ms. Scott. May um, do I have permission to speak? And I'm sorry because I can't raise my hand. Yes, Ms. Scott, please. Thank you. Um, and I apologies again. Normally I would raise my hand or put the chat to get permission. I wouldn't just <laughs> yell something out. Um, I wanted to um, uh, thank you so much for that, Ms. Harvey, um, and um, and also you, Dr. Savoy, for your inquisitive. Uh, questions and um, you know for allowing us the opportunity um, uh, to follow up because it truly is a partnership and we look forward to working with you all and um, you know coming up with with ideas and ways that we can be stronger and um, um, be supportive of you um, but also a true partnership so that we can move these points forward. Um, Dr. Savoy, you had asked about getting uh, getting the curriculum. I guess yes. and I was wondering, has the curriculum committee, have they already formed and put that together? And is that something maybe that um, could be shared perhaps maybe at the next equity meeting? Um, how that relates, because it may answer some of the questions or may lead us in the direction of some of the things that we were talking about. Okay. Um, so, yeah. I believe, and then also, go ahead. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go I'm ahead. sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say maybe a staff li liaison or something could um, could get the curriculum for you. But I think that's you know an excellent point that you made because perhaps that's something that could be shared or discussed um, uh, at our next meeting. And I was saying um, as far as you know in, implicit bias training, I think it would be good. We are going to, as we said, do a deeper dive into it, but to get some ideas and some. Um, direction from you all as the equity committee as to ways that you see, could see it being implemented system-wide throughout the um, school system. So I'll stop there, um, Abir, if, if there's anything that you'd like to say, please go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I was just waiting for the system to process. Um, I want to add on to what Ms. Scott mentioned, but also in response to the curriculum and looking at books that are reflective of our students, especially if they're written by black authors or they're reflective of our students of color. Along with implicit bias, implicit bias is always the first part or the first place we want to start. So people are more aware of, you know, their blinders or what they do or they don't know. Um, but the reason why all of these are interconnected is because if we want to re recruit and retain teachers of color, what are we also doing to really do, a, um, do service to our students and those teachers by also, also having them involved in curriculum writing? If we want culturally responsive textbooks or books or curriculum, we need to have those audited and reviewed by the people who see themselves in those books. And I have very, many, many stories I can talk about, but 
if you look again, like I said, personal, local, and the media, as we say, in equity, the books that are read in Baltimore County that are supposedly reflective of my people, nobody that I know who is from my culture and my background has reviewed those books. Therefore, a lot of the messaging in those books are misleading. So if we want to create culturally responsive books, before we do that, we also need to have people who are reflective from those communities coming in and leading the charge. Again, if we want to retain and recruit teachers of color, then we also need to put them in positions not only of leadership, but of curriculum writing, of lesson planning, of professional development, because from within we can build that capacity. And it's not going to serve us if we continuously want to recruit and retain teachers of color, but we're not utilizing them in the best possible way that we can in order for Baltimore County to grow and be reflective of their students. And we've seen this year and year and time and time again. But in order for us to really make change, we have to get the community, we have to get these teachers involved. Yeah, parent input is very important. And even teachers, students who speak another language, do we have books that are responsive to them in other languages? We want to be proud that in Baltimore County, we speak, I don't know, 24 languages. How many books are reflective of those languages and those cultures as well? So we need to bring in people who can sit there and say, yes, this is a very authentic representation of who I am in my lived experience and not just always depend on the people who are writing the curriculum currently because in TED versus impact, the impact is much more negative than the intent and we really wanna to try to avoid those, those tropes and those, um, those events happening. So in response to how we can get more and do an audit, we need to bring in the right people to do those audits as well. And also for recruitment and retention for teachers, are we having them interviewed by people to understand each other and may share similar lived experiences that they can um, express as well during the interview process. So that's, that's my response and um, you know, I'm happy to um, help in any way. Okay, thank you. Your points are well taken. Anyone else? I believe we have the chair of the curriculum committee on with us. Am I right? Yeah, Dr. Savoy, it's Ms. Lichter. Um, yeah. So I, and I was thinking this even before some of the comments were made, but it just reinforces it because currently one ELA for secondary was piloted this year and two other ones will be piloted next year. So the comments made about who is reviewing and part of those um, focus groups and committees that are looking at the materials um, is crucial with the timing of this um, as they move forward to try to select one at the end of the next school year. So I wanted to relay some of the comments that were made or suggestions to um, Dr. DiDonato as her office continues to look into the three different series. Righty, thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else have a comment or suggestion? or anything they'd like to share regarding this subject matter with, that has been discussed today. Mr. Handy. Yes, thank you, Dr. Savoy. I uh, just wanted mm -hmm. to add that as the council develops their plans and actions, uh, we'll be bringing those back to the committee for review and uh, more dialogue such as this, feedback, and again, just looking to partner. And as Ms. Scott said, you know, with your purview, around policy and budget, looking for how uh, the council um, can partner with the committee, how the committee can help to, to move some of the work forward around uh, policy and budget. So again, thank you all for your time and input this, this evening. I'm turning back over to you, Dr. Savoy. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Handy. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who spoke and especially to the presenters from the advisory, Equity Advisory Council Committee. All right, um, there, if there are no more questions or anything up for discussion, then the last item on the agenda is announcements. The next equity committee meeting is scheduled for Thursday, June 20th, 2024 at four o'clock PM. Is there any further business? Hearing none, Member the meeting, Holland, can you hear me? I'm sorry, yes. Oh, I can you hear guys you. can hear me. Okay, thank you. I was having trouble, so I'm, I apologize. I um, did want to speak on just a couple of the things that were brought up in today's meeting. Um, Ms. Frempong, 
But Mr. Handy, is it too late for her or what? Uh, no, Dr. Savoy, I think we have, um, I know we're still within our time frame, so if okay. um, if it's okay with you, we, I think we can hear comments. That's fine. Thank That's you. fine. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So mm -hmm. I appreciate the council's work in bringing these priorities to us, and I was going to mention as well about budget. So as things are continued to be refined as far as what specifically are ways that um, the priorities are to be addressed, it will be helpful if we um, are able to understand what are the costs. So for example, when you're talking about that implicit bias um, training, what is going to be the cost of something like that so that we can look at how to that gets incorporated into the budget. Um, and then with the curriculum, I heard Ms. Lister speak about, you know, we are in, in, in the in passport meetings, they've talked about how we're pot piloting um, some of these curriculums. So I don't know if there's been a framework or some tool um, that has been developed to make sure that there is a type of equity lens um, addressing the questions that were asked and that were talked about, those points that were talked about. Um, and then the last piece was with the recruitment and retention. I know that there are a lot of, there's a lot of work being done with the recruiting. Um, and so is it possible to get an update from um, HR actually at any of our upcoming meetings just about how things are going with the recruiting, what are things looking like for the upcoming school year um, as far as our numbers um, for uh, diversity. And that was everything, thank you. Hi, um, Doug, is it okay if I speak? It's Michelle Feeney from Recruitment and Staffing. Yes, indeed. I was gonna just um, ask for you to be <laughs> recognized, Ms. Feeney. Thank so, you, yes. thank you. I, I appreciate it. Um, so, hello everyone. I want to um, let you know that we will be presenting to the board on June 11th, an update on recruitment and staffing. So I do uh, invite all of you to uh, watch the board meeting if you are not going to be there. Um, I know many of you will be there in person and, and then you will get kind of a nice overview in June, July and August, I believe all three months of the ongoing efforts in recruitment and staffing. And many of these will speak to some of the questions that you have. Thank you. Is, the, your, uh, is there any further business? So, sure. Dr. Boy, I, uh -huh. I'm sorry, I did see one hand raised, I think from one of our, oh, okay. um, um, someone who's called in, so I'm not sure what the number is but I'll invite them to speak if you're okay with that. Sure. So we see someone else with a hand raised. Um, are you able to speak? Mr. Handy, I think it might be Ms. Heather Denmeyer. She placed something in the chat that, um, I'm not sure if that's who I raised their hand or earlier. not. Yeah, I saw that. She said earlier. she's in a public place. She's listening and will respond in the chat, but I didn't see any follow up from her. OK, got you. Thank you, Ms. Siebold. Mm -hmm. um, so at that rate, I think we have heard from everyone. Uh, who had comments, so Dr. Zaboy, I think we're. Um, ready to close out, but I'll turn it back over to you for that. OK, is there any further business? All right. Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. I'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight. Take care. Have a good evening, thank everyone. You. Good thank evening. you. Have a good evening. Thank you.